Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I've got nine minutes, but I prepared for five, so I'll talk slowly. <laughs> just a joke. Um, so uh, just by way of background, I've been in um, technology for the last uh, 25, 30 years and uh, never, never, ever, ever, ever expected to join a company like GE. Like what is GE, you know, an industrial company it was completely foreign to me, even though I was born and raised in the Motor City, so I know a lot about cars, but then I, I left trying to leave it behind and went to the to the glorious state of California to pursue a career in, in technology and then landed back at GE. And the reason I landed there um, a couple years ago is because of the astonishing work that's going on there that just really kind of gripped my imagination. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the efforts that uh, GE has made to um, not only stay abreast of new technologies and innovation, but to, you know, but to dig in deeply, get our hands dirty, and figure out how we're going to innovate given our current situation. So I want to tell you just, a, there's, it's a vast company, large company, you may know, 300,000 people, um, some 500 factories around the world, about $130 billion in revenue. And um, uh, to be, you know, just for brevity, I'll say that we, you know, we, we, build, we, we, build, we build products, big industrial products. I'll use a jet engine as an example because it's easy for people to relate to. Um, uh, but we're in, in and, we, and most of our money, about 60% of our revenue comes from servicing those large pieces of equipment. So this is an old industrial company we're in markets like oil and gas and power generation, um, uh, healthcare. So first, let me tell you what, um, in terms of uh, technology and innovation, uh, first it's important to understand our motivation. And the problem that we faced starting uh, five, 10 years ago was that we recognized that growth was getting kind of flat. So between one and 4% in terms of productivity growth uh, ac across the uh, plethora of industries that we were in, was insufficient to, you know, to uh, keep the guys on Wall Street happy. We knew that we had to do something to evolve our base of business. Um, and so we realized that we had to get very aggressive um, around the use of data. And so we started an exploration to go to become, to go from being an industrial company, building and servicing large, expensive, equipment that runs critical infrastructure, that delivers the lights, uh, that delivers you know, the systems that we travel on, that delivers all kinds of things that we take for granted. Turns out all of this industrial stuff is really important and it's transforming vis-a-vis -vis digit digitized, I can't even say the word, digitization. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what that is and how we got there. We knew that we could extract a lot more data, and by extracting data from these machines and using that data, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a difficult leap to say we would take data from a ma machine and, and, you know, make it more, give it more utilization or increase its lifetime value or reduce the maintenance costs. And so if you think about the the airplane that you probably took getting here, um, you can just imagine the, 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 the cost of operating an airplane, the cost of maintaining just the jet engine on that airplane, and all the things that are involved in, in keeping that airplane um, uh, flight. And because we make and service that jet engine, we are keenly interested in figuring out how to make sure that it is at playing at the top of its game and that we are maintaining that jet engine as well as we can with the smallest possible cost envelope, but we can't afford to make any mistakes because if something happens on a jet engine and you're in flight, you know, you have pretty disastrous results. So our motivation was to keep, to really transform from an industrial company to a digital industrial company. And we you know, didn't know exactly what that meant, but we started bringing in technologies and developing technologies that combined the idea of material science, physics, sorry, molecules, um, with analytics and economics to figure out how can we transform our business model and what, you know, wh where can this world of digitization really um, take us? 
So it turns out that a machine, a large machine, just like a human being, has a past, has a present, and has a future. And what we want to be able to do is think about how and, and, and design and understand the past of every machine. Where has it been? You know, have you been flying around the Middle East? Have you been flying up and down the coast of the, the West Coast? How are you feeling about that jet engine? How do you feel today? What's your condition today? What's a likely uh, predictable uh, action that might happen tomorrow? So our ability to take and harness that data coming from the jet engine, put that through, aggregate it, apply things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, really understand its history, um, and projecting that out into the future is really the basis for our transformational track down to being a digital industrial. We knew that there was money in there. Now, we didn't exactly know how that would change our business model. We didn't exactly know how far it could take us, and we're still in the middle of that journey. But I can tell you that one of the things that we started creating was this idea of a digital twin that some of you may have heard of. So when you take a piece of physical matter, like this podium, and you digitize it, then you start to think about what else, once I have a digital profile of this, first of all, how deep do I want that profile to be? Do I want to get down to the materials that this was, but do I need to get down to that level of um, analysis on the materials itself? What are all the components that I have to understand from the moment that this podium is designed through its lifetime and how it's going to act, interact with another machine? So we're learning about our machines and we're learning to teach our machines how to learn about themselves. And so we're kind of on this precipice of the edge of digital and physical. And uh, what's so exciting about GE is that we are, you know, we, we cannot wait for somebody else to figure this out. We are aggressively going after this ourselves and we're having to build our own technology in order to manifest some of the results that we're looking for. Uh, so as an example, we're building out an um, a application platform that's designed to handle the massive amounts of data that you're going to get when you take uh, time series data off of a jet engine and then merge that with all kinds of other data, you know, weather data, uh, supply chain data. So we have this notion that as we can build and enrich a model of a physical, moving, living piece of equipment, that really we can start to look at different business models. And in fact, probably the most near-term shift that we've seen in GE is that we're able to shift our business from just being a product and service company to being an outcome-based company, which means that because we can have a lot of control and insight into the whole of the physical jet engine, we can better account for and predict what the uh, outcome will be for the customer, and thus we can approach a customer and say, you know, here is the outcome that you're paying for, as opposed to here is the product or here is the service contract. And so we're, we're, we're taking the shift because, uh, m mostly has to do with the fact that because we're the manufacturer and we own the data, we own the physics, we own the design, and we can now extend that into the behavior of the machine throughout its lifetime it's opening up all kinds of new doors. Now, one machine doesn't exist on an island, just like as humans, we don't, we don't live alone. We live in a community, we live in an ecosystem, and that's what these machines do as well. So as we're creating these digital twins, which is a digitized version of a unique engine, so one engine would have one twin, another would have another twin, and both of these are set up to have continual data enrichment, and now they can start to interact with each other. So I see my time is almost up. Um, uh, just to summarize, the, um, even for a large company, in, by no means do we think that we can rest on our laurels. In fact, what's really shocked me about the last couple of years that I've spent with GE is how aggressive, how chaotic it is by design, how we, are tr we, we, we know that we can get crushed in a nanosecond with all the startups, with all the technologies coming out, and we are not waiting for somebody else to uh, beat us to the punch. What's really exciting is that we also know that we don't know exactly how this will all turn out, but we are experimenting because we have to. It is incumbent on us. We've got this flat growth going on in industry. 
We think that's going to shift. It might take a few more years. It might take another 30 years. But as we are learning to learn about machines applying the most advanced technology that we can find ourselves in, our, um, in a division that we call GE Digital, we're uh, slowly moving the company to explore all kinds of new business models. If I had more time, I could actually point to every one of those 10 areas, because as an organization, we're actually, ex we, we consider innovation to be happening across the board, not just with, you know, with um, uh, uh, product development. So thank you very much. <laughs>